So we're going to talk about fire escapes, and we're going to talk about New York City. Are there New Yorkers here? There are a lot of New Yorkers here. So I'm a New Yorker, and I don't mean I was born in New York. I'm an immigrant. I moved to New York 10 years ago. But one of the great things about New York City, one of the things I love, is that the moment you arrive there, if you want to be a New Yorker, you are. You're in. That's all it takes, wanting to be a New Yorker. This, I think, is why Lin-Manuel Miranda says it's the greatest city in the world. And I think he's right. So I'm a site reliability engineer, shocking no one in this room, and I'm really interested in what happens when things fail, and also in water. And I'm interested in the contingency plans that we use to recover when something breaks. And last year, I was thinking about this a lot, and I was walking around the city, and New York is beautiful in September, so imagine all these soft, you know, the buildings with soft light on them, and I started really noticing the fire escapes. They're everywhere. And they're a contingency plan, right? You don't use a fire escape until all of your normal methods of getting out of the building have failed. And so I started reading about fire escapes. Uh, before I do that, let's talk content. Uh, this is a talk about disasters, disaster prevention, disaster recovery in fire. Um, this means we're going to talk about building fires, like, a lot. Uh, it's going to include stories of some of the worst fires in the history of New York City. I've intentionally kept this talk as low on vivid details as possible, but this still could be difficult for some people. Um, I, I want to quickly talk about what's in here. There are some pictures of buildings on fire, um, and there are details of what started fires, how they spread, and how people died. If this is going to suck for you, please, it is OK to leave with my blessing. Um, on, the, on the next slide, I'm going to give you the TLDR of what I'm going to talk about, so you won't even miss anything. So it's, it's comfortable for you to leave. So here is my thesis. Fire escapes are a hacky bit of afterthought. They're tacked onto the outside of the building after the building is finished. Like, if you're going to use one, you want it to be as good as possible. But you'll prevent more fires if you build better buildings. Similarly, incident response and operations is a hacky bit of afterthought tacked onto the outside of software, often after the software is finished. If you're using it, you want your operations and your incident response to be as good as possible but you'll prevent more outages if you build better software. And finally, buildings have an extremely detailed fire code, and we don't really have an extremely detailed systems engineering or software engineering code, and I think we should. Okay, now I'm going to say the same thing again, but over 35 minutes. <laughs> all right. Fire escapes were built in New York for 100 years. That's all. They didn't start until the 1860s, and by the 1960s, they stopped being allowed. You're not allowed to build them now if you want to. But in 100 years, they thoroughly changed the face of the city. And they really kind of capture the imagination of the people who live in New York. Like, if you search for Fire Escapes NYC on Flickr, you get 13,000 pictures. I did not include them all, but I thought about it. Um, there's some debate now about whether we should start removing them, because in some cases, they're not needed anymore, or whether they should be preserved. I think at least some of them should be preserved, because some of them are just really beautiful, I think. This is another lovely one. What, what makes this look good, I think, is that they made an effort to have the fire escape match the style of the building. It doesn't feel like something that was tacked on at the end. I think that's key. But most of the time, the people adding the fire escapes didn't think of it as part of the building. It was an afterthought. This quote says, the facade, that was architecture. The fire escape was just law. It was an external contingency plan. And I think that's why fire escapes ended up not being successful. But that's jumping to the end. So we're going to look at the evolution of New York City's fire code. By the way, I'm, I'm slightly afraid that there's a building historian in the room who will listen to my, my story of the history of New York and be like, nope, that's not what happened at all. If that's true, please tell me afterwards, uh, possibly by email. Uh, do not stand up and be like, let me tell you. Um, OK, history. We're going to skip the Great Fire of 1776 and jump straight to 1835. The financial district is a commercial, not a residential area, and as a result, the number of fatalities was low. It's two people, which still, two people. That is two people too many. But this is mostly remembered as a fire that cost a lot of money. The city at the time had 26 fire insurance companies, and this put 23 of them completely out of business. The fire was caused by a burst gas pipe in a maze of warehouses. But what, what, you know, the start is usually the least interesting part of an outage. The warehouses were full of extremely expensive, extremely flammable things for, for sale. There were lakes, laces and silks and musical instruments. And it's winter, and there are gale-force winds. So the fire spread really quickly through wooden buildings. 
Inside two hours, it covered 17 city blocks, which I've written down here as 13 acres, and I have no idea what an acre is because I'm a European. The, the city's water supplies were low, and it's a freezing night in December. New York gets cold. So before the firefighters could pull water from the rivers, they had to cut through ice. There was no reliable water supply for the city yet. At the time, it was common to use gunpowder to level buildings, so you would stop the spread of the fire. But two days earlier, there had been a, another fire, and they were out of gunpowder. At the time, the, the fire department was 1,500 people, and all 1,500 had been called in to fight this fire two days earlier, so they were exhausted. Like, I've seen nothing that said they didn't do great, because like, a firefighter at their worst is a badass. Um, but nobody does their best work while well, fatigued. So they fought the fire for 15 hours. So imagine that. You've two, two days previously, you fought this enormous fire. Now 15 hours straight until Marines were able to arrive with more gunpowder and blew up a bunch of buildings along Wall Street and made a fire barrier. So two contingency plans failed. When there's a fire, we'll spray water on it, but we don't have water. We'll use gunpowder, but we don't have gunpowder. And having no gunpowder meant no failure domains. So the fire could spread. So as a result of the fire, they, they changed the fire department. They uh, got better equipment. They moved to a non-volunteer force. And they built an aqueduct, which was the first reliable water supply in the city, which is you know, good for a lot of reasons. But more importantly, they took the opportunity to build a better city, more resilient. The fire spread fast because the buildings were made of wood. And when they replaced them, they built them out of stone. And that paid off 10 years later when there was another enormous fire. The Great Fire of 1845 was very bad, and 30 people died. But it didn't spread as far or as fast because it slowed down when it hit the new stone buildings. All right, jump forward 25 years to 1860, and we're going to talk about tenements. Tenements were these extremely dense, extremely terrible housing. The population of New York City doubled every decade between 1800 and 1880. Every decade, the population doubled. Maybe you've seen this with teams and with software systems. When you're growing rapidly, you can build some technical debt and some culture problems. And this was certainly the case. The landlords made more accommodation by splitting big rooms into smaller and smaller and smaller ones, mostly with no light, no ventilation, no windows. And these were terrible places to live. There was a lot of crime, they were filthy, they were filled with disease. And every report about them mentioned that they were fire traps. By the 1860s, uh, more than half the city lived in tenements like this. That's like 500,000 people. In 1860, two tenement fires happened back to back. The first one started in a bakery on the ground floor of a six-story residential building. Let's start with, it's a residential building with a bakery in the basement, because of course it is. The baker was storing a whole lot of hay and wood shavings, and when they burned, they made really dense smoke, which went up the stairs and killed the people in the top before the fire even got up there. The wooden stairway burned away, so people were trapped, and the roof was four stories higher than any of its neighbors, so people could get up to the roof, but they couldn't get anywhere from there. Firefighters came and put up ladders, but the ladders only went to the fourth floor. The building was six stories tall. And uh, somewhere between 10 and 30 people died, depending on which New York Times article you read from the time. From the time. Um, a month later, four houses in a row burned. All four of these had hatches in the roofs called scuttles to help people get up on the roofs. And here it would have worked, because you could get across the roofs, but the ladders were all missing from the scuttles. Um, and again, at least 10 people died. So these escape plans, the ladders and the scuttles and the roof, they had worked fine for a previous generation of short New York buildings, but they hadn't been updated for the new infrastructure of the city. Like, I'm sure people noticed, but until there was a disaster, it couldn't get priority. The city immediately passed a law to make the tenements more robust against fire. They even said they put an injunction on new tenement construction. You're not allowed to build more until the law is passed. Now houses for more than eight families, which is sort of specific, had to have either fireproof stairs inside or outside the building. What's frustrating is that four years earlier, a commission had looked at the tenements and reported that if there was a fire, tenants on the sixth and seventh floors had basically no chance of survival. And they recommended fireproof stairs, but nothing happened until a bunch of people died. Seven years later, um, the draft riots, which are a whole separate really awful thing I'm not going to talk about, led to the Tenement House Act. This act had extremely good goals, and it was extremely unsuccessful. It said tenements had to have fire escapes, but it didn't really spell out what a fire escape was. They didn't have to make anyone safer. So landlords put up fire escapes that couldn't hold the number of people in the house, or that weren't really well attached to the wall, or fed into tiny spaces. Like, what is a fire escape? Is a rusty ladder a fire escape? Absolutely it is. I want to take a diversion and look at some fire escape patterns, uh, patents, which I admit are not really relevant to SRE, but they're delightful, so humor me. This is a ladder with a counterweight. So imagine climbing down from the seventh floor of your building on this, uh, maybe carrying several of your children in a dress that goes to your ankles. 
This is a kind of a rope ladder that attaches to a windowsill. This is a parachute that rolls up very small. You see there's a person down there. The idea was that you would get one of these and carry it with you everywhere in case you were in a tall building fire situation. According to this patent, I quote, a person desiring to escape seizes one member of the cord rope or chain, as shown in figure one, and forthwith jumps out the window. Like, I'm looking at this thing, and I do not forthwith want to jump out of anything. <laughs> uh, Anna Gunnelly's fire escape is a bridge that you can sling from your roof to another building. It has side rails, so it's only, like, moderately terrifying. And this one, like, <laughs> is good if you want to fight supervillain crime. <laughs> this, this is important. You might think, you might look at this and think, this is just a parachute helmet, but it is not. It is a parachute helmet and a pair of very bouncy shoes. <laughs> All of these patents were granted, by the way. Um, finally, I read this one three times, and I'm convinced that the guy invented a rope. It's, <laughs> it's the most Silicon Valley invention of 1882. <laughs> but let's be clear, rope is a very popular type of fire escape. In fact, it was a state of the art for hotels. And I don't mean a ladder made of rope. I mean, like, literally a rope. That every hotel room had to have a rope, and that was the law. And even at the time, people were like, what? <laughs> this is a snarky ca cartoon from a magazine in 1880, 1887 have a lot of people trying and failing to use the ropes. I'm going to zoom in. Uh, this lady is saying, slide down a rope in my nightdress with everyone looking at me? Never. I'll be cremated first. I'm like, fair enough. These escape plans are designed for the easiest case, someone with good upper body strength who isn't wearing a skirt or carrying a child. And if your disaster plan only works for the easiest case, it's not a very good plan. I want to emphasize that a rope is better than nothing. Like, every one of those patterns, even, like, Batman, even uh, Mr. Parachute Hat, they're better than nothing. If a fire started, you'd be glad of anything you have. But this escape plans are not where I would put my efforts if I wanted to have fewer people die in fires. But this is where the law was. Anyway, the Tenement House Act. Um, even with fire escapes, tenements were bad. They were uh, overcrowded, no ventilation, and it was perfectly legal to store lots of combustible materials in them. One other thing the Tenement Act said was that every room now had to have a window. And again, this sounds great, but they didn't define what even is a window. So the landlords cut holes in interior walls between rooms and said, now you have a window. Uh, they're interior windows. A decade later, the law is like, sigh, OK, you have to have an exterior window. And uh, so the landlords started constructing these new buildings with air shafts. There's a picture of one there. They're just these little narrow gaps between buildings. And uh, they cut holes in those leading into the gap. OK, now bear in mind, there's no indoor plumbing in these buildings and you're up six floors. So you can imagine how that goes. Um, one article I read at the time, I love this, it described the air, sh air shafts as festering tubes of disease, which I think is so poetic. And it said they provided just enough oxygen to help fire spread. So, you know, that's the thing. Anyway, many of the fire escapes just led down into these. And there's no way out from there. It's not like there's a door at the bottom. By 1871, iron fire escapes were becoming common, and of course people used them as extra space. New York is not famous for having large apartments, so kids played and slept out on them, and people aired their mattresses there, and they hung laundry, and you see that now. Like, there's so many bikes out on them, and barbecues, and cat runs, and gardens, and all of that is illegal since 1871. The law dealt with this by saying that every fire escape had to have a sign like this one that said you could be fined $10 for obstructing the fire escape, and you still see these signs around. And that's fair, because usable fire escapes are better than unusable ones. But again, it is perfectly legal at this time to run your explosive business out of the basement. And lots of fires are starting because of people deep frying crawlers, which I keep meaning to find out, but I think they're like donuts. Um, but not round. Anyway, the regulations are mostly not enforced anyway, so who cares? In 1876, this is a, a staggering number, 280, 278 people died in Cadman Plaza in what was, at the time, the worst theater fire in US, in US history. Now it's the third worst. The worst was in 1903 in Chicago. Um, there's, so there's a play on. The final act's about to start, and the stage manager noticed a really small fire. And it was typical at the time to keep a bucket of water beside the stage, but they'd forgotten to put it there. There was a fire hose, but there was so much scenery and clutter on top of it that he couldn't get to it. So he asked a couple of carpenters, uh, could they put the fire out just by like, hitting it with sticks? Uh, that didn't work. I, you're shocked, right? And it actually spread some sparks, which set fire to the loft. Uh, the actors wanted to avoid a panic, so they pretended it was part of the show. And like, quelling panic is, is laudable of them, but it meant there was delayed, it delayed people getting out. And when people did freak out and realize, 
um, they stampeded, and they couldn't all fit down the narrow stairway from the, the cheap seats at the top. Um, there are no fire escapes, and some of the exits were locked to prevent against gate crashes. The jury blamed the theater owners, and this is a big deal that, that the jury actually did prosecute. And uh, new laws were written as well, including not storing stuff on the stage and widening the exits. In 1882, the building code said that theaters now had to have automatic sprinklers. This is the first automated response in fire, for fire in, his, in this city. Uh, but what I find remarkable about this, this fire happened nine years after regulation said that the tenements had to have safe exits. But the laws didn't carry over to theaters. We kept making these very, very specific laws to close the loophole that we had just seen. And it turns out the laws didn't carry over to other types of buildings either, like hotels or schools or factories or offices. And I'm not going to talk about most of those, and trust me, it's better this way. Um, we'll look at factories in a minute. It's the only one. Um, but first, we get proper no-kidding tenement regulation at last, and this one didn't take a devastating fire to make it happen. And for this, we thank Jacob, Jacob Rees. In 1890, this guy, Jacob Rees, he published a book about tenement life called How the Other Half Lived, and he did a lecture tour on it, and he told people. And kind of up until now, the, the fancy upper middle class people of the city, they'd kind of known, right? They, they knew the tenements were terrible, but it was something they didn't have to think about. But there were photographs, and it, it built a lot of sympathy. It was harder to ignore. And over the next decade, people started to care about the conditions of the tenements. It was probably part empathy. It was part that they were afraid of smallpox coming out of there. But it doesn't matter. They cared. I was really reassured when I saw this. Because until then, it was like fire, very specific law, fire, very specific law. But this one didn't have a disaster. Um, this came from someone saying, look how much this sucks. And that gives me some hope. Anyway, the next couple of tenement house acts stopped sucking. Buildings now had to have actual windows, not air shafts. Fire escapes couldn't be ladders anymore. They had to have balconies and stairs and the things you would recognize as a fire escape now. Even better, your neighbors can no longer boil oil in the basement. Thank you, Tenement Act. And all new construction, the most important thing, though I bet it didn't seem it at the time, all new construction has to have interior fire partitions. We have failure domains. We're finally looking at stopping fires from starting and spreading, not just escaping from them. And it actually starts to be enforced. Welcome to the 20th century, but it still sucks in factories. So the triangle shirtwaist is the famous and like, well, they're, they're sort of all awful, but it's the most awful one. But the Newark factory fire uh, a few months earlier is this textbook disaster. Um, I wish I had more time to talk about it because it's just, you read the, you read the description of this thing and it's just like, seriously, the whole way down. Um, this is a building that's shared by paper box companies, a nightgown factory and a lamp manufacturer. But it had previously been used by machine companies, so all of the floors and walls are soaked in oil. It has two fire escapes for the size of this building. One ends up on a roof with no way down from there. The other is a really, really heavy ladder that needs to be physically lifted down. This is another emergency plan that only works for strong people. The uh, factory employed almost exclusively young women, and in this fire, they weren't able to lift down the ladder. So there was one fire escape for this entire, uh, entire building, and it didn't even go all the way to the ground. So there was no fire alarm. Fire started in the lamp factory. There's no fire alarm. Everyone had evacuated the bottom three floors before the people on the top even knew that there was a fire. The only door up to the fourth floor was kept locked. That was against the law, but people did it anyway. Um, people on the ground brought a net and started catching people, jumping, and it broke, and they only had one net. 25 people died. 32 people were badly injured. Um, this building had had 10 fires in 10 years, which it turns out to be expensive in insurance. So even though they knew there was a fire, and even though the firehouse was very nearby, they didn't tell them because they didn't want another fire on their record. They tried to put it out themselves. And the victims had never been in a fire drill. They didn't know what to do. We got, um, what, what do I have, 100, 116 people trying to get out of the building, and they had never had a fire drill. They freaked out. They were like, 30 other, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link to a great article about this in the end. There's like 30 other interesting lessons from this fire. Um, when officials investigated, they said the root cause was that was not the wall soaked in grease. It wasn't delaying causing the firefighters or the locked door or the lack of fire escapes. It was the girls panicked. This is the root cause. I, I feel like I don't need to say this to SRE, but that was not the root cause, OK? <laughs> there is no such thing as a root cause, but that was not it. Um, human reaction is never, ever the cause. Humans act in human ways. So what happened afterwards was nothing. The jury didn't convict, and that really meant that nothing happened. 
One juror said he later regretted that. New Yorkers, so this is in New York, 10 miles away from New York. New Yorkers sort of looked at their factories and were like, huh, yeah, that's a thing. But it didn't happen right in the city, so they did not create a very specific law about it. The New York fire chief said, the city may have a fire as deadly as the one in New York at any time. And that's 100% of what happened. Four months later, the city had a much worse fire. 146 people um, died inside 18 minutes in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. This building was considered fireproof, which is good, but it was a clothing factory and was packed with clothing hanging so tightly together that it might as well have been made of cloth. It should have had three fire escapes, it had one. That collapsed under the weight of people escaping. People dropped from the seventh floor. One exit was locked. The guy with the key escaped without unlocking it. Firefighters came, but the fire ladders and the water from the hoses could get up to the sixth floor. Before they could get up to the fourth, now they can get to the sixth, but the city is taller again. And the building, the factory was between the seventh and the ninth. And the employers already knew about the problems. The previous year, employees had organized a strike for the working conditions, and they'd been fired for it. Um, the building had a warning notice, but it hadn't fixed its violations. Right, so what happened? Um, stronger water pump, you know, we, we fixed our technology, we fixed our incident response, a longer ladder, we can get to the taller buildings again until they get taller again. Um, but most importantly, building conditions took a huge step forward. Uh, a commission was started to look into fire hazards, and uh, 16 new laws inside three years. Uh, some of these are about working conditions, some about fire. Again, everyone knew factories were bad, but the law didn't change until a bunch of people died on the island of Manhattan. Sprinklers started being required in factories, but only factories over seven stories tall, because you don't want to get too general about this stuff. Um, a professional organization, the American Society of Safety Engineers, which still exists, was founded, and people started looking at fire escapes differently. After the disaster, a report called them a pitiful delusion and a type of exit condemned by the experience of many fires. Uh, in, in 1923, the New York Times had an article praising fireproof interior walls. They said, this kind of amazes me, they said, for six years, there has been no loss of life by fire in the 200 buildings treated with interior walls, and the cost is less than fire escapes. 200 buildings had no fire deaths, not no fires, no fire deaths in six years, and that made the newspaper. That is how bad the fire situation was. The fireproof walls became code. In 1929, all new buildings over 75 feet had to have them and had to have two staircases. By 1929, we have failure domains. They're part of the code at last. And the code made a whole bunch of frequent improvements in the next decades, nearly always as a result of something horrible happening. Uh, like, let's see, uh, the 1968 code required sprinklers for hotels and high-rise buildings, but not nightclubs or residential buildings. In 1975, seven people died in a nightclub. Now we require sprinklers for nightclubs. 1998, there were two really bad residential fires in residences with four or more units. So now we have sprinklers required in residences with four or more units. And the law will change again as horrible things happen. There's no retrofitting of existing buildings, by the way. Any building you're in in New York is as safe as the fire code was on the year it was renovated. Think about that when you visit. Okay. Thank you for staying with me for all that. We're now going to talk about computers, and you can stop tensing. Nothing, it's computers, horrible things will happen, but not fire for the rest of this. Um, the number of, of, of fire deaths, I just said no one more death, but here we go. The number of fire deaths didn't decrease because we built better fire escapes. It was because we built better buildings. In the end, the fire interior walls, the, the fireproof interior walls were the things that made the big difference. But for decades, we optimized for escaping from fires. Fire escapes kind of suck, like even at their best, they kind of suck. Not everyone can get out a window, windows get locked, people put air conditioners in them, and childproof bars that are also adult-proof. I don't know about you, but I can never open those things. Uh, fire escapes get covered in snow and ice and bicycles and plants. They rust and get detached from the wall. The ladder gets stuck. They make people really worried about burglars. And if you leave the window open, fire comes out and blocks the path down. But most importantly, they never, ever get tested. Fire escapes have one time of intense use, during a fire. If they're going to collapse, they're going to collapse during a fire. You don't find out they don't work until you need them. If we're using a fire escape to escape a fire, a lot of things had to go wrong. We had three chances not to be here. Like, ideally, the fire wouldn't have started at all. Something made the first spark. It was heat and fuel and oxygen. Maybe we could have made it not start. Or we could have stopped it while it was tiny. Like, who hasn't burned toast? It's not a big deal. You catch it quickly, you extinguish it. Or for bigger fires, maybe there's a sprinkler system that triggers automatically. Like, it makes a mess, but you don't have a complete building outage. If we have proper failure domains, we can keep the fire 
or the outage to one small part of the building or the infrastructure, we can at least make the fire spread very slowly. So we have time to react in a non-urgent way. But if we miss those three chances, we end up here at the fourth stage, urgently reacting to something that's out of our control. We had a lot of chances to not be here. But now we probably care a lot about fire escapes. It would be better to not be here. Whether it's a building or a software system, the most important reliability work is making problems stop before they get to that fourth stage. I got a recruiter mail a couple of years ago from a company I won't name, but they're here, that said, our site reliability engineers are seen as firefighters. I was like, what a waste of SREs. If your SREs or your production folks are focused on emergency response, you're wasting like at least 75% of their skill set. I know there's this really strong association with SREs and on call and the pager, but that should be such a small part of the job. It's not, it's not even a necessary part of the job. You don't need to be on call to be a reliability expert. And right, everyone who's writing code should have reliability in mind, right? No one is like, oh, hi, I will write some crap code and I would like if it crashed. But just like we have people who specialize in UI and security, which everyone should care about, we have people who specialize in reliability. And that is us. We're not firefighters. We need to be involved at every stage. So those four stages could be summarized as prevention, detection, isolation, and response. Let's look at them again, but in the context of software. So something caused the first tiny breakage. Maybe we changed something, something got overloaded, we bulldozed a cable. Like a certain amount of sparks is fine. Some things are allowed to more problems than others. But we should know what our SLAs allow. We have error budgets for a reason. But we do need to stop those things from happening more than we can handle. This is a quote by Alan Ullman. Uh, we build computer systems like we build our cities, over time, without a plan, on top of ruins. We don't need to do that. We could choose to not do that. We can think about our stacks from the start with reliability in mind. We can spend time on high-level design review and try to find holes in the system before we build it. And we can catch bugs before they ship. We do this with code review, we have a second pair of eyes in our designs as well, but also by writing good tests for the stuff that can happen and the stuff that can't happen. We can use fault injection like fuzz testing to test input that just doesn't occur to us. And we validate everything. Like, even if you write the only caller of a function, you can check what input you just passed yourself. You can assume that anyone who calls one of your functions, including future you, is either an idiot or a monster. Be really paranoid. Um, we can hide matches from ourselves. A stove igniter is a better tool than a box of matches. Uh, we shouldn't give our users access to functions or data they don't need. And when they do need it, we should provide clean, safe interfaces that are really hard to get wrong. We shouldn't even give ourselves more access than we need. This is why we have sudo. We don't use root. Um, the fire department recommends you don't operate a stove while drunk or sleepy. And the same goes for a root prompt or an admin console. Many outages are caused by changes, so we make them deliberately and carefully. And canarying helps. Of course, we push them to one instance before we push them to all the instances. We push out new features in a way that makes it very fast to turn it off if we need to. Over time, the best practices for our industry have changed. Like, if you think about what we were doing even five years ago, like we, don't, we mostly don't log in as root anymore. If you do, don't tell me. We use config management. We use change control. We use repeatable builds. We socialize the idea of reliability in books and articles and at conferences. But OK, stage two, sometimes things still break. We have two options for immediate response. We have humans staring intently at a computer, or we have robots. Anyone who's ever heard me speak about anything will know that I think robots are better. Um, Alice Goldfuss said in her Monodorama talk last year, if you have three minute SLAs that you expect to be satisfied by a human, you don't have SLAs. She's right. Alice is always right, but she's right here as well. Humans aren't fast enough for four nines. Uh, smoke alarms, alerts, it's a fine balance, as we all know if we've ever burned toast and had trouble shutting up the smoke alarm or had trouble finding the right threshold for when we want to get paged. Uh, in both cases, sometimes we silence or we take the batteries out. Don't do that. Fix it. Don't take the batteries out. That will kill you. No more death. Okay. Um, having humans respond to small problems and keep reacting to small problems will burn them out. It's using up your gunpowder on the small fires, and then you get nothing left for the big ones. So ideally, have a robot deal with the thing. Make it happen slowly enough that humans don't need to burn adrenaline to get, to get involved in it. The less time we spend deciding what to do, the better. 
Like in a fire, in your kitchen, there's an oil fire. You don't want to stop and read all the small print on the side of your fire extinguisher and be like, is this water, is this going to make it worse? You want the tools to be available and hand to be the right tools, and you want it to be really hard to get them wrong. Provide a one-click one rollback for all of your changes. Let your on-caller put out the fire by rolling back, and then we can calmly figure out what happened. Even better than automatic response is automatic recovery. There's lots of ways we do this at, at low levels of abstraction. Like if you drop a packet, TCP don't care. It's like it's built into the algorithm. You resend it. You're not going to page a human for like every time you fail a checksum. But we, we still sometimes do page a human for one crashed server. We need automatic recovery higher up the stack. If tasks are flapping, we should be able to write that out. If a backend goes missing, we should be able to coast at least for a while. If a machine dies, it should automatically be replaced. Health checking and load balancing should move traffic from an unhealthy region to a healthy region. Like, maybe you want to let humans know, but you should let them know, like, everything is cool, I'm just saying, you know, there's this thing. Not like, welcome to 3 a.m., a machine rebooted. You don't want humans involved in failing over, or actually most things. We just screw it up. Okay, stage three. There's a fire. It's happening. Now, we really want to not let it get on anything it's not already on. Failure domains split the infrastructure up so that only one part of it is affected by any given outage. So like maybe we shard our users over a bunch of different servers, or maybe we add redundant network connectivity. If the problem is going to move as components get overloaded, we want it to move slowly enough that we can control it. We don't want to cascade. Humans panic the first time they get paged, or the first time they hit a situation that they just haven't seen before. They flail. They may make the problem worse. Just like we're, we make it incredibly common to hear a smoke alarm, I'd calmly like sigh and lock your screen and find your way outside. Make it so that a disaster is never, uh, it never like shuts us down in, in shock and surprise. At intervals, tell people you're doing a controlled outage and take a system offline and see what breaks. Let people get their panic out of the way, you know, while, while you're there staring at the systems. This is also good for shaking out dependencies that you haven't considered. Because if you say we're turning off this low SLA system, you may find some high SLA systems that are like, wait, what? Don't. And you'll find out you had users you didn't even know you had. Um, you know the phenomenon where uh, you're paged for a thing, and over the course of fixing the thing, you hit a bunch of unintuitive commands or out-of-date documentation that takes you forever to do something simple? Or you make it worse? Uh, these, these traps are like a basement full of straw, or walls covered in oil, or a far hose with cluttered scenery on top of it. It makes it very, very hard for you to move around safely as you try to fix the real problem. And fatigue is another one. Fatigue is, uh, is an encumbrance. Fatigue is clutter. You're way more likely to make a mistake if you're exhausted. So set rules about how many incidents any person should have to deal with and how many hours they're allowed to respond to problems before their on-call shift is over. Sorry, we've got to find someone else to cover. You've been on call for a long time, and humans should not live like that. If it means you end up, uh, your company ends up having a whole lot of two or four or six hour on-call shifts, you paid your fires too much. You're burning out your humans. It's a waste of good humans. But sometimes that won't work. We don't have perfect software. I mean, sometimes we will have to respond to outages. And we can set ourselves for success, up for success there, too. First off, and the thing that broke my heart through those stories, don't lock your fire exits. If you know there's a disaster and you know how to fix it, or a potential disaster, don't disable the fix. Don't lock yourself out of your control plane by having a response that depends on the thing that just went down. Don't comment out your automatic recovery system. Please don't take the batteries out of your smoke alarm. I know I said that before, but it's really important. Literally or metaphorically. Um, communicate about outages earlier, because it is the worst when you've just spent half an hour debugging, and then you get the mail from someone being like, oh yeah, by the way, this thing is down. And document your exits. A lot of the time, we know how we expect our systems to fail, like because they failed like that before, or it's a specific thing we've set an alert for. Uh, runbook entries let us tell an on-caller what to do. And also we can document the things not to do, or make it impossible to do them. Make it so that the easiest path out is also the right one. Firefighters train using controlled outages, and we can too. Just like we have drills to prevent panic, we can use them to speed up our response time. A wheel of misfortune is a regular exercise where you pick an arbitrary outage from a list that might happen, and you work through it to make sure that you know what to do. So you should have regular fake outages, wheels of misfortune, and large-scale disaster tests. All right, that was kind of a whirlwind list of best practices. 
But I think nothing, nothing new or controversial there. What I'm saying is that reliability can't be added at the end. If you're fixing a terrible system by putting all of your energy into that fourth stage with human response, you have a tenement. The foul air is coming in through the air shafts, and it's not somewhere humans should live. Reliability needs to be built into the software, and failure needs to be built into the software. Um, this is a, a graph. Uh, it's kind of a terrible graph because I had, I had bad data here, but it is GNU plot, so that's cool. Um, for fire deaths in New York City, the numbers, it's one year per decade, but they're all kind of representative. Uh, 71 people died of fire in New York City in 2017, 48 in 2016. This is still a lot of people, but 2016 was the lowest number on record. Uh, the, the, fire, the Bronx fire in December that killed 12 people was the deadliest in 25 years. So how did we get from it's news that people haven't died in these 200 buildings to here? This, this helped. This is the New York City fire code. It has 444 pages and it costs $140, and I know that because I really tried to get one because I think it would be so cool to stand here and wave it in the air. <laughs> the guy at the library was like, why do you want that? <laughs> and I was like, no, it's, it would be cool. And he's like, okay, so there's a thing called a website. And I was like, no. <laughs> Fire safety is also mentioned a lot in the city building code, the construction code, the state building code, the National Fire Prevention Agency electrical code, and a whole lot of other things. I don't know the difference between all of these. I'm just saying there is a lot of code. But we don't have a fire code for software. We have a bunch of O'Reilly books, and they're really good. But our, you know, we, we do document things. But nothing tells us to prioritize one set of rules over another. Why don't we have a fire code? Like, serious question. It has been proposed from time to time. There's this amazing list uh, I recommended a lot called the Risks Digest about public safety risks caused by computers. And it's been running since the 80s. I was digging around on there, as you do, and uh, I found this report from 1986 called Software, a Vital Key to UK Competitiveness, which is actually pretty prescient for the 80s, I think, to realize. Um, and it had a whole appendix on safety-critical software. It starts with, no computer software failure has killed or injured a large number of people. It is just conceivable that such a tragedy could occur. And it has detailed sections about disaster prevention. It includes this fantastic line, in spite of this, nobody trusts a computer, and this lack of faith is amply justified. <laughs> um, this advisory council predicted a time when it wouldn't be possible to recover from software failure by just switching off the computer and doing the thing manually. So it's like, it's 1986, and they're like, someday we won't be able to do things as fast as computers. I think that, that was very forward thinking of them. Uh, we're there now, just in case anyone didn't realize, we're there now. Um, they wanted certification. You would only be allowed to operate a life critical computer or a computer system if you had a license. And you had to have a certified software engineer and a bunch of other stuff. And you would have to get recertified every five years. They also proposed on call shifts, disaster recovery practice drills, and postmortems, including postmortems for near misses, which we should all do, by the way. A lot of this feels prescient, and we ended up doing it, but we never required certification. If you were at least in November, you uh, might have seen John Carruthers' closing keynote about aviation safety. Like buildings, plane travel only got safer after a lot of really bad accidents. John pointed out that we might think of computing as kind of new and young, like we're, we're sort of hip and idiotic. You know, we're, we're fun, right? Because we're, we're young, we're a young industry. But we're the same age as a lot of grown-up industries. Software and aviation and power and emergency medicine all took a big jump forward after World War II but we didn't grow up. I think maybe that's because the stakes are lower. At least that's part of the reason. Software mostly hasn't had the ability to cause massive disasters. We have had life-threatening and sometimes fatal bugs, though. Um, the Therac 25 radiation therapy machine had a concurrent <laughs> programming bug that made it occasionally give its patients hundreds of times more radiation than they were supposed to get. Three people died. The London Ambulance Dispatch Failure was a new uh, software system that had been deployed that wasn't load tested and had a memory leak. It couldn't keep track of where the ambulances failed, and uh, they arrived hours late. 46 people died. Um, there are two more here that I haven't heard of any negative outcomes from it, but one is a, an OCR bug where uh, when you scan something, it changes the numbers. And the other is an autocorrect for medication. In both cases, you can see how that might be fatal in a doctor's office. So far, software has been able to kill people like one or two at a time. We haven't had the wide-scale disasters that have shocked the other industries into growing up. 
But now we're really starting to use software for life critical systems more and more. And every month, we send hug ups on Twitter to the people working on whatever the latest massive software outage is. At some point, these two things will overlap. Do you feel like we're ready for this kind of responsibility? I do not. Um, the 1910s journalist, uh, Miss Innes Weed, she summed it up. She said, it took an Iroquois theater fire to improve the safety of theaters. It took a Titanic disaster to improve the safety of vessels. It took a New York fire and a Triangle fire to bring New York State's fire legislation to its present inefficiency. I love that. Present inefficiency. Aviation regulations came from airline disasters. Um, Emil told us yesterday about the um, Bhopal disaster. Chemical, chemical engineering regulation came from chemical disasters. Mining regulation came from mining disasters, and so on. But some regulations didn't come from fire. A bunch came from a lot of people deciding to care about the same thing at the same time. We in this room are people who care about reliability. This is why we're here. We care about reliability, and we can encourage other people to care about reliability. That is our job. And we have to do it. Software is increasingly used for life-critical systems. Some people in this room will run software that can kill people. Maybe some people already do. I don't want us to wait for a disaster to decide not to build tenements. We can decide now to create professional standards, safety codes, and opt in to a professional organization to keep ourselves honest. And the entire industry needs to learn from every major outages. We can have no more secrets. Um, before I finish, if you're in New York, LA, or a bunch of other places, you can get free smoke alarms. Please do. Um, the top link there has a list of a whole lot of interesting fire history references. I didn't realize I'd gone over. I'm sorry, Kurt. Um, and uh, yeah, noidea.dog slash fire. Fireproof software. Thank you for your time. <laughs>